slightly pissed, slightly pissed. My anger management issues are kind of displaying themselves right now. I just recorded like 10 minutes of this and then the thing just got corrupt. I don't know what the fuck happened. Yeah, we are leaving, we learn, Maya. We move on. Now you can do it better this time. Yeah, that's the way to look at it. Breathe in, breathe the fuck out. Jesus. Ah, oh, sweet, a baby has sauce. Okay, hi guys, hello. Maya is the name, crazy is the game. <laughs> this is by all means necessary, it's my podcast. Heard about it, heard about it, good. How have you been doing? Are you doing okay? Mm, it's it's fourth Monday of the month. It doesn't get any easier because there's the fifth. Not gonna spoil it for you, but there's five Mondays in this motherfucking month. And I, I used to love August. Like I like August. Why, why why you gotta add a Monday to it? But hey, that means an extra Monday of BAM. And next episode, I don't know what I'm gonna publish because I'm on fucking holiday. So I'm gonna go into some archive shit on Patreon and publish the shit out of it. But this week, okay, this week has kind of like consolidated me. It might not have been the worst idea for me to have chosen to study journalism, okay? There was a point. This week I went into deep dive and I was like, this is why I was interested in this, like, in the first place. I liked researching this story because this was a bitch to structure. So nobody covers it, which is great because then you can't play dry shit, which is what I like <laughs> because then, you know, I don't get in shit. There's no risk of like plagiarizing somebody else's work. But still, that means there's only a few articles out there to dig from. So I had to find stories to kind of relay this to you. So this week, I'm not telling you one story. No, no, no. I'm telling you three stories that are connected. <coughs> great. So two of them are stories of the people targeted by the group I'm telling you about today. And then the third one is the person is about the person that exposed them. So it's like an expose. Also, this is the very first episode that I can truly tell you that I'm kind of scared to cover this. <laughs> okay, not gonna lie. Oh, remember Takashi? Yeah, I know I said it during that episode, but T-Dog and me are fine. <laughs> we are on T-Dog terms, okay? T-Dog, we good, right? We good, T-6-9? Mm, we good. T has bigger issues, and I have bigger issues, okay? <laughs> so before we dive into this story today, I kind of feel like I need to explain something. Well, this is gonna get weird and you're like, hmm, really? You're explaining this? Like, are you okay in the head? So I'm telling you a story about a mafia today, and it's called Bessa Mafia. This is an Albanian mafia, and Bessa in Albanian means trust. I kept this for the end of the video, but I kind of feel like just to put you in the mindset, I need to tell you from the get-go. Basically, where I'm from and Albania, we don't get along, okay? That's not a lie. But yeah, I'm not telling you a biased account of a story today, I'm just telling you that maybe people are gonna come for me <laughs> and hate me for this. And actually what they will probably hate me for is not even how I tell you this story, because this is how you find the information on the internet. It's a non-biased account of facts. It's what I'm gonna tell right now. I'm gonna talk to you about trust for a minute. Yeah, so listen to me. <laughs> trust is very important where we come from. And that's what they're gonna hate, because that's kind of like a similarity we have together. Sorry guys. We're just too close by. Trust in the East, well, in the Balkans in general, but yeah, in the East is much more of a factor than in the West from everything I lived through that I can tell you. So it's much more of a bigger deal. Like, we take this shit seriously. And that's kind of like the prevalent motive throughout this whole story. That everything is so, like, serious when it comes to, like, trust and shit. And that's kind of like the only core that they have to, to stick by. So what I wanted to mention on trust is that we have this home. Why I got reminded of this is because of like its prevalence during the story. So back home, even when you choose like the godmother and the godfather, if it's for a wedding or if it is like for baptism, let's say your child's baptism, you choose these people seriously. And I mean, yeah, duh, like, you would, <laughs> you know, it's, it should be, like, your best friend or whatever, you know, it should be somebody. But back home, we actually take this to a degree, like, if something was to happen, let's say, to my husband or, like, God forbid, like, to, to a child, right, one day, then that person, like, those godparents are the ones that are to take care of, well, 
whoever's left, right? <laughs> this is getting morbid, but you catch my flow, right? So these would be the people that you would entrust your life with. I kind of don't have that feeling and I've been living here for about 10 years. I don't have that feeling here from, you know, the weddings that I've attended or anything that this is taken to that degree of seriousness. And honestly, in my opinion, totally should have. Okay, so now <laughs> I just remembered last week we spoke about Jeffrey Dahmer who took everything seriously. He took like serial killing, like it was fucking his lifeline. <laughs> it's like, this is my serious shit. These people, though, even though the trust is the premise of everything, didn't take their thing as seriously as, well, or maybe they did and nobody knows just how seriously they've taken it. Okay, it will make sense. Listen, let's, let's dive in. Let me set the scene. Imagine a life where someone has paid a hitman to take you out. People end up dead and the hitman hired might not be behind it after all. There's a whole mafia operation behind your head, ensuring they cover their tracks by all means necessary. This is the story of Bessa Mafia. Maya from the future here. Since this episode was released, the victim's sister of the first story, so Amy Elwan's sister, got in touch with me. Well, with me and every other podcaster, every other YouTuber that has covered her story and said to, if possible, remove the story because obviously it kind of intensifies the grief of the family, seeing the coverage that the story is getting. Not everybody wants their story out. The family is actually getting like attacked and bullied for this, which is just unacceptable. So I'll remove the first story and then just summarize by some Mafia website for you before just continuing with the rest of the recorded episode. But I just wanted to say, because obviously they have contacted everybody else, just please consider if you're a podcast, if you have a platform, to actually respect family's wishes. So if you want to know the core of the story, if you search for Bessa Mafia, it's the first one that comes online. The murderer is Stephen Elwine, and that's that from me on that story. I hope that um, the Elwine family finds some peace by having all of us remove this content. And even if you go on and read and want to research into that case, please don't share anything online, because then again, that just contributes to their grief. Just respect basically the family's wishes. This case, for example, made me think, because I always thought like, well, you know, it's raising awareness, all of that. And I would personally like my case in the case of my murder, God forbid. Yes, I would personally like my case to be showcased on different YouTube channels, different podcasts, but then not everybody wants that. And my family would also probably find that weird. So if a family requests for you to delete somebody's podcast and you can actually confirm it's a family and not like some sick random on the internet, please do so. Now let me actually just explain Bessa Mafia quickly, because obviously I put it as part of the story. So Bessa Mafia is this hitman website, right? And Bessa means trust in Albanian, hence why I droned on <laughs> about trust for like 10 minutes in the intro. It's most obviously a scam website, however, like a lot of people fall for it. What happens is obviously they fall into a circle where they pay a hitman, the hitman doesn't deliver, then they chase after it, but this hitman called Yura, well Yura is kind of like a representative in the Vesta West, website. Kind of like, you know, when you hit somebody on live chat and always the same person responds, that's kind of Yura. I believe personally that Yura is multiple people and then they're just representing themselves as him. So he is not like a typical person that, you know, after you would pay somebody that they would just disappear on you. No. Yura here is the person that actually eggs you on. He's like, yeah, you, you said you want them dead. Like, you said this is desperate. Like, we can do it in multiple morbid ways, even more morbid than you intended. And they kind of lead you on to think of even more disturbing ways to engage this hitman and to actually commit a crime, with the furthest escalation being taking the matter into your own hands. So briefly about how it worked for the first story and just in general, you can have different Bitcoin apps. So there was this particular one in this story, it was called Local Bitcoins. You meet with a person, so it all seems legit. You give them cash, they scan like a QR code 
and transfer you the bitcoins and then you pay with those bitcoins online to the Besa Mafia website. Besa Mafia, I forgot to mention, is accessible through the dark web. Uh, the browser I think is called Tor, I never actually deeply looked into it. But according to this Supernatural podcast that I listened, the Supernatural with Ashley Flowers, she says that you know how um, on the normal regular web, right, the URLs would finish with .com or .co on the dark net, they would finish with dot .onion. However, again, I think you need specific browsers to access the dark web. So it's accessible through this, then you pay with Bitcoin, you get kind of like a confirmation. Obviously, whatever handle you use is traceable. So, you know, the protagonist of the story that I have taken away was actually working in IT and even he couldn't like properly eliminate it forever. And before even paying or before even hiring a hitman, you would go online. So you actually fill out a form. You know how like there's different websites and they have those contact forms. It's like, hey, message us and we'll respond within 48 hours. Yeah, except you're hiring a hitman. Which again, just tells you how much premeditation goes into this. Just think about that. Obviously, it's like the first thing that I thought about. Like you could have stopped at so many levels. You could have not trusted the scam at so many levels. You are that person that actually clicks on every link in every email that they get. I'm like, yo, be careful out there, man. <laughs> I mean, they purposely went on this website. Not funny. So they take an oath because Albanians take Bessa, meaning trust, seriously. So it will kind of be like an oath of trust. From a lot of sources, what you can then find is people referring to this being like, well, I have given you my Bessa, so why are you betraying it right now? It's like, well, because they're hitmen, okay? Not, not the most credible of people. And that is if we, we believe that there are actually people behind this website in the first place, which when you listen to the second and the first story, you will doubt that a lot. They also claim to be the escrow service. So it's like, okay, you pay the money and it will only actually go through once a job is completed. Again, kind of like a lot of websites do. I work for a rental marketplace that operates as an escrow service. I use for the podcast like logo and stuff, people per hour. So I use like a freelancer from there. And again, it works like an escrow service. So, so the money actually only leaves my account and goes to theirs if the job is done. However, obviously this is a scam. You get no refunds. So the sequence of events is you do all of this to pay for, to get somebody killed. They egg you on so that they have all of these messages. They have all this incriminating history on you until you're that pissed off that you ask for a refund. Then obviously they don't get your refund. It's a hitman service. And then you are pushed to the brink to that point that you might take the matter into their own hands. In the L1 case, that's what police believed it has happened. However, that's also the one case where the police actually started suspecting that there might actually be a hitman. Somebody, somebody else might have actually taken it into their own hands. In the end, the husband has been found guilty and they are serving time in prison now. However, on this occasion, it was actually brought to the public eye like as an actual awareness. That's why I thought like the story was important to tell. Also in in this particular story, but like there are other stories as well where this egging on thing that I mentioned is done by you and the administrators on the website is usually done in such a way that even the person that requested a hit kind of passes on the culpability of their own on to the person that they want killed. So in the first story that I eliminated was infidelity. It can be different things, but it's that egging on that's like critically disturbing for me. Because you can see how it can push people to actually take matter into their own hands and commit murder themselves. And obviously it's a tactic to milk even more money, to milk even more bitcoins. The usual price on the Besa Mafia website is about 6,000 cash money. Again, all of these websites, just a reminder, all of these websites are a scam and everything is traceable. It doesn't matter if it's dark net, it's related to your IP address, it's related to your computer. People will never learn. Have you never watched a true crime TV show? A lot of it is exaggerated, but a lot of it is true, okay? Garcia is gonna hunt you all down. That's sort of a rough summary of how the website works, how it operates. Now I'm actually gonna let you listen to the rest of the episode that I recorded back in the day. So here's to Maya from the past. Take the mic, bitch. Take the mic. Second story is about a woman called Alexis Stern. So on this particular night in February 2019, again, too close for comfort, too close. She's 18 and she is uh, going to Minnesota to meet with the police because the police again alerts Alexis that somebody has put a hit out on her and that they want her dead just in case she didn't understand the first thing. 
And she's like, okay, that's scary, but y you know who it is, right? And they're like, well, they are hiding under an alias, Mastermind365. These handles, I swear to God. And the police tells Alexis that they have had all the information because of this mastermind. So they knew where she lived, where she worked, the picture of her, description of her, again, everything. And they have paid 5k worth of Bitcoin for her to be assassinated. In this particular story, we have a person who, because um, Alexis was interviewed by 48 Hours TV show. So we have a person who actually analyzed Yura's writings. And she said that his English is very good but the evidence suggests that he is a foreigner and also doesn't work alone. Which kind of like, again, what I'm saying, I don't think it's one person behind the writings. So this woman found millions and millions in the account that she believes is linked to Yura. Back to that police station. Alexis has been interviewed and the police obviously has to ask the question, like, do you have any idea who would want you dead? And she's like, okay, there's this one guy. <laughs> You know how I'm 18 and I live online as well as everybody else. What's the moral of this story? Don't live only online. Cool. <laughs> Get hobbies that are not just connected to the online world. So she met this guy from the UK. <laughs> Hello. Hey, so his name is Stephen Fry. No, it's not. My sincere apologies to the real Stephen Fry. I'll listen to his audiobooks. Okay, his name is Adrian Fry, okay? I have had enough with Stevens today, man. Fuck it, yeah. This guy's name? Adrian. We now hate another name. So Alexis here had a thing for British accent. And she was like, oh, quite flattered, you know. It was like one of her first relationships or her first relationship. She was like, cool, 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 cool. Yeah, you can definitely come to visit to fucking Minnesota. So Adrian, who's a fucking freak, does. So when he first came to visit, he booked this hotel close to her house. How romantic. And they dated kind of for about two years. And then when she told him that it's over, well, that's when he turned ugly. And he told her that she deserves everything horrible that happens to her. And I love Alexis here. She's like, truly, truly one after my heart. Listen, this mastermind 365 person, super inventive, first of all. Again, what a boring, like, dog day god. Yeah, you, you get it, you get it. Also, I mean, super dumb because the wife was a dog trainer, but here, mastermind, man. He sends a picture of Alexis to you, of course. And then he's like, okay, I want her kidnapped. Yeah, scare the shit out of her. But then a week after, he's like, I just want this person dead. And Alexis said, that, that, like, his wording sounded very British, so she knew it was Adrian. Because he would say stuff like, I would just like this person dead, but if there's any more information, you would, like, inbox me. And she's like, I don't know anybody in the US that would use the term inbox me. But Adrian would say it a lot. I think, like, inbox me wasn't the thing that got me. It was the fact that it was like, if there's any more information you need, it's such a fucking giveaway. <laughs> It's like, stop with the politeness. British people out there giving away their fucking politeness, even online. So she further analyzes his messages. He's like, well, Adrian used to write I in lowercase, and this mastermind person does that as well. Also, he used to write thank you as one word, which who the fuck does that? <laughs> but mastermind as well. She goes fully on fucking criminal minds shit. Basically, so now when further negotiations with Yura, Adrian says... My problem is that I don't currently have an extra five grand, but I will have it in about a week's time. And Alexis is like, listen to this message that I've got from Adrian. It says, if there's a chance you may like me in a year's time, then I will happily wait. First of all, pathetic, but it is. <laughs> so she was like, hey, week's time and year's time are common in British English. And also, Adrian would leave out the apostrophe in both of those. So this is most death for him. Again, not something that I would have said. It's more the fact that he says five grand. And it's just that whole phrase of I don't currently have an extra five grand. But, you know, girl, whatever works for you, whatever you know from the messages. Now, of course, because he can't pay up and Yura is just not like Yura is just egging him on. He is now like, okay, cool. Just help me get a silencer. Just help me get a gun. And now enter Lisa again, the dark web ex expert in this story. And she's like, this is what worries me because the same thing happened with Steven in the Elwine story, in the first story. And she's like, I think that these men and this website in particular accounts for this. So it's like, okay, we get the money, right? And then they realize it's a scam. 
so they need to resort to doing this by themselves they need to resort to violence they need to like do it themselves and then it's a win-win situation we get the money we don't do the dirty work we can't be charged technically and yeah that person just gets in prison luckily in this story she's still alive and they have still again not connected this to agent as far as i've read so luckily here alexis is still alive they actually haven't found the identity of this mastermind 365 uh, adrian fry is just roaming the streets and his mom is again one of those fucking enablers who is like she has ruined my son's life but imagine like okay so if it was a different way around if it was like your daughter wouldn't you want this to be taken seriously so this brings us to the third story of the day and that's the story about well the person that uncovered all of this and they're based here in london Hello. This journalist for Wired, John Wolpicelli, I hope that's how you pronounce it, got a message in his inbox in June 2018, and the subject read, suicide or murder? And they have shared this completely other story about this guy called Brian Njoroge, who was found dead from a fatal gunshot wound to the head near a baseball field in Clarksville, Indiana. And his death was ruled a suicide, but this person didn't think so clearly. Because they were like, look at this. There is this um, handle, Toonbib. Toonbib? Yeah. Super smart. These handles love them. Who exchanged messages with the mafia boss, sent pictures of Joroge in the suit, like pictures from his school yearbook, and an address where they could find this guy who was actually a soldier and usually resided on this military base in Kentucky. And he's like, yeah, this is where he would stay for a few days. And it would be specified, like, which days they're going to stay there. And they paid about 5,500 in Bitcoin for the hit. And then the response comes from, well, whoever was the, the best mafia website, let's say Yura. I will assign an operative to your job and it will be done in about a week. Is this okay? I will get back to you shortly with an estimated date. This was on June the 1st, Toonbee never answered, but on June the 9th, Brian was found dead. So this email has come from our Londoner Monteiro, who is the one that kind of exposed everybody and has written to the guy for uh, Wired. And well, two years before sending him that email in 2016, Montero was just uh, your typical nerdy guy. So he's like in his 30s with, you know, thick hair, just the man of weird hobbies. He was like into Reddit and shit. There's a picture of him online. It's just like a picture of his back staring into like five screens. <laughs> You get that type, you get the gist. Montero here went into a deep motherfucking dive. And he said all these people looking for a hitman would download Tor, which is the browser that would use encryption to ensure like anonymity, and then it would allow them to access the dark web. Then under the false names, these website users would complete this form and they would request murder. <laughs> Just love how it's like a form online. It's like, yeah, we'll get back to you within 48 hours. Of course, then they pay. There's no refund, as we know. And the website admin is scamming them. There's no execution. is No assassination is ever executed. The website admin, or Yura, under Yura's name in some cases, would then obviously just, you know, continue messaging them, but just giving them a bullshit of lies and just keeping the bitcoins. And just keep the bitcoins. So, Montero was convinced that this hitman for hire site and every other one that exists is all a scam, but people are turning up dead anyways, so how come? Montero then obviously writes blog posts about this as he's researching it, and he writes that, yep, all of them are scams, there's no like evidence that any hitman has ever killed a person online. And then on February 20th, 2016, the anonymous user makes an edit to his own article. And the edit sounded something like, all assassination sites are scams, except for Bessa Mafia, which is real. Montero here freaks out and he like urges Rational Wiki, which is the website, to just remove the edit. But then a few days later, Montero gets another message and it says that it's one of the admins from Bessa Mafia and they ask him, would it be possible for us to pay for a true and honest positive review? <laughs> you gotta, you gotta love that wording. It's like, it's honest, but it also must be positive. <laughs> and Yura signs it off, and he signs it off with the words, let me know 
if we can prove to you that we are legit. So Montero is like, nah, I ain't reviewing you, but I'm gonna keep messaging you, try to poke holes in your fucking business idea, mate. Because your website is shit, you can still see what the website look like. The best way for me to explain it to you is, you know when you're searching like, I don't know, Daily Mail, like some weird ass fucking things that's just unsearchable. So all of these websites that have like hundreds of ads, they're just popping at you and there's some disgusting fucking things. It's like pictures of people's asses or like, ears with the wax in them and you're like oh what the fuck is this is this some amateur shit yep that's it <laughs> this one made me laugh okay so he's still trying to convince montero and he's like listen we are open to suggestions we will do our best to make it the best marketplace focusing on body harm revenge and property destruction <laughs> you know how you have depot it's like yeah it's marketplace clothes community no body harm revenge and property destruction what is not clear so yura here is like this is how i prove it to you i'm gonna have a person of your choice beaten up come on montero choose it for me then he's persistent this person is so fucking persistent he's like okay you know how you have your blog let me pay you i'm gonna pay you a 50 dollar monthly retainer to feature Bessa mafia on your blog as a banner. Matteo's like, what is going on? Like, can I get rid of this guy without like, how do I milk him for information without him being annoying as fuck? Obviously, when he declines, Yura becomes menacing. He's like, be neutral to our website. Unless you do that, we will pay some cheap freelancers to fill articles and submit posts and comments claiming you're an undercover cop. Now, when you read this, you're like, nah. <laughs> This is the part that you want to remember, okay? Montero here doesn't do himself all that much justice just because he just keeps at it. I mean, cool, cool mate, I understand why you do it, I understand your journal instincts here, but yeah, they just kind of messed with the mafia, not the smartest decision. Am I doing the smartest decision right now? Probably not. So he does this exchange on the blog and mocks Yura, mocks this mafia. And weeks later, somebody leaves a comment, a link to the video. It says it's a dedication to him, well, to his handle, which was Pirate London. What follows is a video of 30 seconds of darkness, and then you can see that there's a car set on fire. So it appears that here our guy Montero now has a threat to his uh, name because they just fucking blazed somebody's car on fire. He goes to Charing Cross police station to report it and they actually bring it to the Met police, the cybersecurity unit. But they kind of say like, yep, the car doesn't look to have been destroyed within the UK, so it's out of our jurisdiction, goodbye. Here our boy Montero now decides to do something risky to like provoke them and see, well, what they're actually gonna do. So he creates a handle called uh, Booty McBootface and requests a hit on a fictional person that he calls Bob the Builder. And as he's doing this, so he's not doing this just for go jokes, he's spotting how they communicate, how each message is just given like a unique ID. And then he's like, okay, what would happen if I was to just combine like this ID with the website URL? And he's like, okay, I can read every single person message. Like, this is, what is this website? Who created this shit? So our boy Montero here actually manages by discovering this vulnerability to download the Bestas Mafia's entire message database and just puts it in his archives. Like, that's it. He discovers this digital wallet where apparently the clients can just withdraw the funds anytime. You know, it's only once the kill is confirmed that it will go into escrow, of course. And by discovering this vulnerability, he actually realized that the message archive was essentially a kill list. So there were targets, there were conflicts, there were instigators, everything was there. So he was like, what if somebody wanted to take matters into their own hands? Is this list just basically encouraging murders by just anybody who wishes to act as that hitman that doesn't exist? Again, he tries to go to the police, but the police is like, go to the NCA, National Crime Agency. And then they didn't answer the calls of the messages. So National Counterterrorism Security Office says that the matter was out of the jurisdiction again. And then he goes to the FBI, and the FBI suggests that he talks to the NCA. So he's just like in this circle of hell now. 
Remember April 2016 when that big hack happened? You know, first story, Stephen L. Wine, when everything was kind of like exposed. And then they told Amy that, yeah, she has a target on her back, basically. Well, you were obviously then convinced everybody, like, no, don't worry about it. We are not a scam. Nobody has hacked into our system. Meanwhile, he is working on launching a new rebranded website, you know, again, to fucking steal people's Bitcoin. Due to this hack, Montero, who now obviously is living from these vulnerabilities on the website, actually manages to get even the access to Yura's Gmail. Here he gets all of the admin correspondence. And he even found emails in which Yura is just talking about buying like English course, messages to freelancers, because obviously everybody was paid here to advertise and put, you know, what was it? The true positive reviews. And just date on Bitcoin payments. And him and his mate take the website down. They actually change the website to just a picture of a door. It's like this shut, rusty door. And under the their logo, it says, uh, Bessa Mafia has closed for business. After six months of scamming criminals for the bitcoins and stealing over 100 BTC, which is about 65k, uh, the site has closed. No one has ever been beaten up or killed. And the tune was playing, which said, So long, for farewell, auf Wiedersehen, goodbye. But of course, this doesn't stop SMF, this doesn't stop Yura. They start operating through a new assassination market, it's called Crime Bay. Which again, they use the same fucking source code. So Monterey is just now on this website reading their messages again, taking everything down. And this is now around the time when the first story happened and this made Montero devastated because he was like, well, I, yes, I thought it was all a scam, but now there's somebody that actually either killed a person or there might have been a hitman that was actually out for this job and just framed the guy. But soon he had bigger problems because in June 2016, the police barges into Montero's flat and arrests him. Now, if you remember the threats that Yura made on the website being like, yeah, I'm gonna expose you as a cop. Or like, yeah, you know, like, he was just making threats being like, well, you don't write the reviews for me, I'm gonna get an expose for you. So Yura was paying his fucking freelancers all this time to write these WordPress blog posts, which weren't like special, anything special, but they were strong on the SEO, which is like the algorithm where, you know, you can find everything easily in Google, page number one, one of the first articles, let's hit it. So these posts reported that Chris Montero and two other subjects created a hitman for higher website Bessa Mafia on the dark web. So what does the police do? They search Montero's place because the warrant was obviously out to look for the admin, you know, he was like, yeah, maybe he is the admin. He might be in possession of more victim data, criminal evidence, incriminating him and everybody else. Luckily for him, he managed to actually convince, well, it took about a couple of days in custody, to be honest, but luckily for him, he managed to convince the police that he was actually working with the agency, which just, hey, different agents, can you communicate, do that thing? Because otherwise, they found what they found on his computers would have been super incriminating. He's just having all this database and the archive of, like, target names, messages, data on Bitcoin payments. Luckily for him, he was left without charges, but this actually meant that now the NCA was taking Bessa Mafia seriously. And they have now started tracking down some of the users and charging them with a conspiracy to commit a crime. Of course, these characters are all fucking dubious people. So they arrest like a British doctor, David Crichton. He has ordered a hit on the former financial advisor. He was clear because he said like, oh yeah, I just committed this, you know, I just put this request out of frustration and people just fucking believed him. It's like there is one, I feel like there is a difference between just out, you know, out of outrage, out of anger, being like, oh, I'm gonna kill you. Even that is like, it, it, try not to say it too often, okay? But yeah, I feel like there's an escalation between that and like posting a request. There's a couple of steps there actually going on a hitman website, submitting a form, clicking send. There's a couple of like processes, things where you could stop yourself. Then there was the Italian-born woman Emmanuela Consortini, 
who was arrested by the NCA and she was charged for six years for commissioning the murder of her ex-boyfriend. There's a lot of just ex-partner stuff on there. And they have fought for about a year now that actually the police managed to find Yura because they shut the crime bay down and they're like, cool, everything has been resolved and Montero stopped researching into the topic. However, in December 2017, he gets an email. And the email is apparently from Yura, accusing Montero of just being immoral, exposing this Western Mafia. Oh my god, we have done so much for you. At that point, the second story comes into play, because 48 Hours was around that time, making the story about, well, Alexis. And then they were like, hey, Montero, you know how you expose them? Wanna have an interview? And at that time, like, Montero was like, okay, cool, let me dig into this, you know, see what happened since. And he realized Yura launched another website called Cosa Nostra, genius, and that now he is the Italian capo Barbossa, <laughs> this guy. This guy's like, I can be whoever I want to be, it's an online world. Again, he, because he can now read all of the messages, so he has set up the Google alerts for everybody's name that he read there. And that's how he found this first story on Brian Geroge. And Brian's dad actually reached out to Montero and he was like, yep, I'm just not happy with how they closed this case shut. And there's like a couple of weird things, like he's definitely not a suicidal person, but also he has changed the beneficiary for his life insurance policy to somebody else. So it's not us anymore, it's this female friend we can't track. So this is kind of where the story ends. Nothing is defined, the police still thinks that they have shut down the actual website and well everybody behind it is in prison but are they or are they just that cocky that they are gonna actually get back out if you ask me they're most definitely operating under a different website it's kind of like um what's that case that i covered the uh, blue whale challenge where yep they're just gonna change the name they're just gonna change the name of the game and operate under other sketchy website and hope that nobody discovers that they're still using the same goddamn bad code that everybody can apparently crack online. But with this story, what I think is the, truly the question is... So even if one Yura is down, there's probably gonna be plenty more where he came from. And it's just up to people exposing these cases. But the question that really prevails is... Are people actually taking the matters into their own hands because they can access the kill list, they can access the targets? Have people actually just been taking it into their own hands? Or can something like this actually drive humans? Obviously due to your frustration, due to the loss of money, due to not being able to pay any more funds or not trusting the trust mafia to take the matters into their own hands and just actually commit the kills themselves. What do you think? Clip me up. This case is so fucking fascinating to me. But now a bit of a background on the Mafia or, well, its online presence, I guess. It kind of resurfaced in February 2016. Well, that's when the blog post resurfaced. And mostly, obviously, people are trying to say that it's a real thing. And how they're doing this, as you got from this story, is that Yura would hire for cheap these freelance writers all over the world to dominate the SEO search. So the SEO search, super important. It's, you know, like, even when I name, like, these podcast episodes, I could shoot myself in the foot if I don't put, like, the case name. Right, so it's important stuff like that. It's, like, stuff like hashtags that you have now, things around, well, naming it into something catchy, clickbaity kind of things, and just making sure that, obviously, the name of the people in the case, etc., is included so that people can easily find you and then you're, like, on top of Google pages. So it's all about the great marketing and the positive reviews that people were leaving for money. So he was using stuff like Fiverr, um, which is, you know, the service where you can just get freelance work and getting just cheap labor. As for Yura himself, among other people, he has hired this freelancer to create his websites as well. So this person has been interviewed and they have said they have created murderforhire.com, desamafia.com and hirehitman.com. Well, very, very SEO heavy. <laughs> it's like very easy to find. If you are literally looking for hire a hitman. Yeah, that kind of comes in. And people have speculated just based on all of this information, everything they could gather from like online and stuff. So people have connected Yura to Romania. Then they were like, okay, 
because of these conversations with them, like, he's just because of how he speaks, he's likely to be in his 20s. But then other people were like, well, he always kind of tries to play the good cop. He's like, yeah, you know, leading people on and just saying like, well, I can definitely make it happen. Stuff like that. So they were like, what if he is a police informer? And he wrote this super interesting thing in one of the blog posts. If you intend to report hitman scams, you're basically siding up with those would-be murderers, helping them to avoid scams and traps, and helping them to find other means to do their kill. It is a moral right to scam criminals and would-be murderers if this helps saving victims. So he technically he's playing as a good guy who's like, well, look at all these people that can actually murder and then like get caught for it, rather than what, just reporting them, then you would avoid all of these people that, you know, might not be pushed to the brink of it and actually commit murder. That's some weird ass logic, but yeah, it's super interesting to think about. He signed this message off as Barbosa lifesaver. And his kind of defense in like these blog posts is actually that he is, well, first of all, just hindering the potential murderer's plans, robbing them of the precious time and money, so technically just pissing them off, which is a dangerous game to play, my man, Yura. Okay, and more significantly, he said that he's giving all the target information to the police and saying that he's been working with the FBI. So, according to him, or Barbosa again, he's like, yeah, the FBI doesn't want me, they want the murderers, right? They don't care about the scammer, they care about the murderers, which wouldn't be far-fetched, as, as far-fetched as you think, because, yeah, if he has not, like, he has not been jailed, right? If he is still the person writing to Montero, which I think that might actually be him because they had like this connection or whatever, <laughs> you know, the trust bit. He could have struck a deal with the FBI and could we actually just be egging people on and seeing who is liable enough to just submit something like this on the website and yep, who is unstable enough to actually just go through with submitting Bitcoin, paying for a hit on a person. Or it could be totally false, which is what the guy that initially exposed this to the FBI says. It's like, yeah, he messed millions out of this. I mean, he would lose all of that coming to the police and stuff, so why would he do it? Why would he just suddenly try to like work with the police where his whole thing is to frame other people they are working for the police so that they get caught and that would expose him, that would put him at like a super high risk of actually getting caught and shutting this down forever. Well, never shut down forever, as you know, by <laughs> looking through these cases. In terms of motivation, well, I think, like, as for the people requesting these hits, it's an easy way out, right? It's because they believe that it will never be tied to them, that they have covered all of their footsteps, they're online, you know, their ID is covered up, they're hiding behind this handle, and this can never be tied to them. It's Bitcoin, it's not even real money. You know, there's no, like, physical transaction, there's no fingerprints technically on it. If this is the Mafia just doing the hit, going off their own thing, well, then it's kind of to do with reputation, because it's not just the monetary gain, but then now they kind of need to show that they are sticking to what is promised. They're like, no, you put trust in us, right? You put Bessa into us and we are here to deliver. But also I feel it's a bit of that like power to choose who lives, who dies, if the mafia again is behind any of these hits, because well, first of all, that's the whole purpose of it, right? Yep, yeah, that's if you believe that this is not a scam in the first place. The problem with this is that it doesn't have to be the mafia, it doesn't have to be about Bessa at all. Because what if somebody who knows who people behind those handles were and knew who would take the blame, in case of Amy and Stephen Alwan, for example. This opens up a whole different world where we allow for multiple chances for innocent people to get killed and for somebody else to take the blame. And that is a dangerous motherfucking world to be living in. That's the story about Bessa Mafia. I can't fucking keep them short, can I? Mm -mm. Don't get alarmed, this is a mid-episode scheduled announcement. 
It's nothing scary, it won't hurt. In fact, it will do the opposite of hurting. It will embody your body and soul. It can cover your laptop. It can be your mom's next favorite mug. It can be that tea that you showcase in the gym and you're like, oh, look at me all strong and shit. It is called merchandise, ladies and gentlemen. That bam has merch now. And you can get it, you can get it, you can get it everywhere. Okay, not everywhere, but you know what I mean. I made it super easy. You just click on those links in bio. You can either get it off Teespring and use Podbam for 25% off, or you can get it on a Redbubble. There's different items here and there. And as it's all kind of like in beta version, you know, I welcome any feedback, any future merch ideas that you're like, I want this kind of shirt. And I'll be like, say no more, homie. I gotcha. And also, if you want to see how those tees and shirts and just merch in general looks like, well, either on me or just how it looks in flesh, well, then follow me on the socials because I'm posting pictures there. So follow that bam pod on Instagram and Twitter and just check how it actually looks like. And they'll be like, damn, this is exactly what I want for my life. Yes, merch dash for your eyes and your tits. Okay, let's continue with this episode. Don't you just wish I did ads for everything? Wait, I need to hit myself up with this pronunciation. Wait. Anne Boleyn. Mm-hmm. Really? Not Boleyn? Anne Boleyn. Anne Boleyn. It sounds like a disease. Yeah, that's our mini of the day. It's Anne Boleyn's house. So as some of you know, I'm like going through the process of getting like British citizenship, right? So to do that, you need to have something called life in the UK test. Well, you know, it's called different things in different countries as you're going for citizenship, but I'm doing it in the UK. Cool, cool, not relevant. And truly Anne Boleyn, or well, the way I pronounce it, which is Anne Boleyn, it just sounds better. The way is this last name? Lady. Well, learning about Henry VIII and just Anne Boleyn in general was truly the best part of this. Like, the only part where I was like, this was sick, this gave me some drama, man. Also, there's that movie where Scarlett Johansson is, like, at the peak of her hotness. So, yeah, go watch that. Is it accurate? Uh, It's heavily dramatized, but historically, sort of there. Sort of. I put it, I'm doing this story because it's truly the proof. You know how I say, like, if you unjustly kill somebody, they're gonna haunt you for life. Doesn't matter what you do. They're gonna fucking haunt your dreams. Yep, this is it. This is it. Her place is haunted. I put, like, an ex that never leaves your life. Her ghost was like, no. (laughs) Now, when you Google Anne Boleyn, like, the questions, you know, like, how those, like, autocorrect, like, autofill things? Yeah. Just fill out the rest of the question because they're fucking nosy ass, presumptuous bitch. So yeah, the questions that pop up was, was Anne Boleyn pretty? How many fingers did Anne Boleyn have? Which I was like, girl, this is why we relate, listen. And then, well, it's Queen Elizabeth related to Anne Boleyn. Fuck that. The fingers question this is the only important thing here. She had six Fingers, girl, this is why we relate. I was born with like six fingers on each hand and six toes on every foot. If you didn't know that, if I didn't get to mention it like 30 plus episodes that we've had so far, hey, I was a mutant, yes. And then like every time I hear this story, which is literally this is the first time that I've heard that like somebody else was born a mutant, I'm like, we are sisters. Okay, so... Okay, so she she was uh, inferior to me. <laughs> Jesus. She had only um, six figures on her right hand. But then the question, like, is Anne Boleyn pretty? Is just answered. Like, she had long dark hair and beautiful expressive dark, almost black eyes. It seems highly unlikely that although Anne was not beautiful in a conventional 16th century way, which is just pure ugly. She was most certainly charming, sexy, sophisticated, witty, elegant, stylish and intelligent. But she pretty man then. She pretty. She played by Natalie Portman. She pretty. Okay, cool. Moving on from Google searches. And after living in France during her youth, returned to England in 1522 and became maid of honor to Catherine of Aragon, who was a Henry VIII's queen consort at the time. So Boleyn's sister Mary, 
who was one of the king's mistresses, introduced her to Henry VIII when Henry was like, fuck your sister, I'm now obsessed with you, and then started writing love letters to Boleyn around 1525. Henry had a different version of monogamy. <laughs> he was like, monogamy who? He had a different version of romance, is what I want to say. In those letters, he would say, if you give yourself up heart, body, and soul to me, I will take you for my only mistress, rejecting from thought and affection all others. Save yourself to serve only you. So romantic, Henry. And Anne was like, yeah, I don't want to be a mistress. I kind of like want to be a wife, you know, like, fuck this shit. This is such a fucking Shakespearean era. So she wrote to him, Your wife I cannot be, both in respect of mine own unworthiness and also because you have a queen already. Your mistress I will not be. I was a boss ass bitch, okay? Also, a quick note on Henry. He was, well, according to him, entering these, like, relationships. So he was kind of pissed. He was entering these, like, adulterous relationships because he really wanted a son. And Catherine of Aragon couldn't give him a male child. I love the next sentence so much. So it says, following a six-year debate, during which time Henry and Boleyn had courted discreetly and discovered that she was pregnant in early 1533. Well, then they weren't fucking debating, were they? They were fucking... Now they marry on a slice, so they marry secretly, which means that the Pope didn't bless it, which is gonna get some drama, get some drama, man. But now Queen Anne gives like birth to Elizabeth I, so it's again a daughter. Henry just didn't know that pussy rules the world, this guy. And this is the part that's kind of well represented in the movie, just because it's like overly dramatized. Well, I don't know if it was well represented, I assume it was. Just because drama. It's now, because again, he's on a quest, he's on, I mean, I'm just cheating on you for this sole purpose, this is only one excuse. As soon as I get a son, I'm gonna stop, like, I'm gonna be good, listen. He starts cheating with her on like two of her maids of honor, which again, <laughs> you choose your friends and maids of honor wisely. But one of them is Jane Seymour, you see, Scarlett Johansson, yes. And like his previous wife, Anne was jealous and she was kind of pissed that he was cheating on her. It's like, yeah, you're making me look like a mug. It's like her exact royal words. And then him and Jane, well, according to history, it was mostly actually Henry that was plotting this, but yeah, according to the movie, it was all women's work, right? And gives birth to like a stillborn male child. He's like, fuck this bitch. Yeah, let's just accuse her of like incest, witchcraft, all the undeniable things in the 1500s that we bring you to the gallows. So he's like, yeah, let's add like adultery there, let's add like conspiracy against the king, everything there, and then he's just like being hung, man. And you see Scarlett Johansson there be like, well, I might have fucked up here, but yeah, I'm getting that dick. Scarlett, every time. <laughs> this is not a story about Anne Boleyn, well, kind of truly. <laughs> It's only a story about that blade because there's like a couple of lines on the actual haunting. So you know how she was beheaded, right? Because of all of this. Well, if you didn't, hey, welcome. You know now. Her ghost is said to haunt the house in Norfolk, which is supposed to be her birthplace. I mean, if anything, this must have expired Harry Potter because it's a headless ghost. It's like nearly headless Nick. And this ghost is said to return every 19th of May, which is the anniversary of her execution. So as the night falls on this day, her ghost rides up to the house in a coach that's carried by the headless horseman. And she has her own head in her lap. And it's when the coach arrives to her house that it vanishes into the thin air. Tradition also has it that when the news of her death reached Blickling Hall in 1536, Four headless horses were seen dragging the body of a headless man across Norfolk. So there's something in the air in Norfolk. There, there's, people might be high a bit. Or it's, it's ghosts, guys. And it's not just her ghost, but it's her dad's ghost, so Sir Thomas's ghost as well, that is said to be haunting the whereabouts. But this one does it because he is cursed, because obviously he didn't protect Anne from being executed by Henry, did he? I mean, what could he have done? Like, it was different times, guys. It was different times. But yeah, watch that movie, you know. Mm. Also, did all of you watch Don John? That movie, I just fucking love it. It's like the peak of Scarlett's career, but it's also like Joseph Gordon-Lewitt. Like, you've never seen him before. You're like, what the fuck? Why are you the one playing a wanker? I love that movie. Pornography. No, don't don't ban pornography. Yeah. Ban ban the pedophiles. Don't ban the pornography. That's my take on everything. <laughs>
Wild opinions, wild. Well, you should keep you fixed for a while. But now look at the time, god damn it, again Maya did it. Just, like had a fucking podcast over an hour for some reason. Because she can't stop fucking researching mafia businesses. Also, yes, I was doing the research now on mafia, on Bessa Mafia. My husband walk in and it, as you know, even from this podcast, like once I'm like tired or just deep into something, I mumble a lot, right? Yeah, <laughs> I have a podcast, but I mumble a lot. So he was like, what are you doing? So I was like deep into it. I was like, yeah, I'm just researching mafia. And, uh, and he's like, you're researching like a MILF? And I just laughed. I was like, damn right. That's the episode title. That's it. No reason. No correlation. That's it. Clickbait. Get them to click on it for 10 seconds of actually explaining what researching like a MILF is all about. But yeah, this is not. <laughs> you are going into your next Zoom call. Mm-hmm. And you're listening to that manager who is telling you like how grateful everybody should be, you know, that they kept you there during the quarantine and how you should actually just be so grateful that yeah, they have given you a job, like you haven't earned it yourself, like you didn't go, to, didn't have to go through so many bullshit fucking interviews, processes, tasks, whatever they made you do like for that company, you're like, yeah. No, I'm grateful to myself. And you just remind yourself in those moments. Don't snap, don't say anything. Just remind yourself that you're the one that holds the power. Because we have moved away from Aunt Boleyn era. We have moved away from the era when like the employees have zero power. You can create like at my company where we just created like a WhatsApp group where we bitch about people, but we also fought for our rights. We're like, no, you go represent it. We want X, Y, Z. We want like a pay rise. We want like normal hours. We want like normal breaks. I'm like, no, this is a union. This is how it works. Also, just remember that you have power. You don't have all the power. Most definitely, no, you can't just sneak their laptop. But hey, you always have the power to ruin them on Glassdoor, on the socials, anywhere. And if you do it in a wise way, it doesn't reflect on you. Because if you do it in an like, unbiased, like pros and cons kind of way, then it just gives people an outline of what exactly is going on in the company. And it doesn't sound like you're just having, you know, your much deserved rent online. So yeah, always keep that in the back of your head. In all of these bullshit meetings, somebody's just telling you a story. They're like, ah, oh, the mission, whatever, whatever. And you're like, no, I've got the power. I've got the power. But yeah, while you remind yourself who the fuck you are, until next week, why don't you again try to, in every action, every single thing that you do, keep making the world also, just, you know, as an additional thing, a better place, you know, just maybe, maybe one motive, you know, at at like one singular time and place. Yeah. Mm. One motive at a time. (laughs) Bye, fuckers.